Hang on, my. There's always something I forget. Yeah, don't yeah. worry. Should have said it. <laughs> okay, there we go. Oh, yeah. Can everybody see this? Yep. So, um, as it says here, this is a very brief introduction. Um, this is a topic that could take days um, to go through. Actually, most people, it takes a lifetime. So this is li literally um, just a very quick summary. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for coming today. And I want to thank you for coming to learn from a Muslim, because there are many courses. They've actually, the first course I ever saw about Islam in Northern Ireland was from the 1800s, and, but it wasn't run by a Muslim. And one of the things that I find, you know, when I, even when I was, if I put Islam in Google, you'll find um, Wiki Islam comes up it's in the corner. Um, it's a site that's not run by Muslims. And if any Muslim actually reads it, they're reading it going, what is this? But you have to get sometimes to the second page to actually get a site that's actually run by Muslims. And it might not even be a mainstream site or represent the majority of Muslims. So, you know, a lot of people, um, we know from the um, Northern Irish Life and Time Survey, the vast majority of people, of people in Northern Ireland have never met a Muslim. And the majority of people learn about Islam through the media. And unfortunately, um, that means that a lot of people come with particular biases and understandings of Islam. A lot of people think Islam is inherently oppressive to women that we're intolerant. Um, racism is woke, as long as you are racist and say it's a religious, um, it doesn't matter if it's theological. Um, some people portray Muslims as the enemy within, that there's somehow this subversive nature that is inherent to Muslims. Um, and obviously the most extreme form, we've got the great replacement theories and you know the far right narratives that Muslims are in Europe to take over. Doesn't matter that Muslims have been in Europe for hundreds and centuries, uh, hundreds of years and centuries, you know, we're, this, this, this narrative has really taken off recently. And of course, the big trope, angry Muslims. Um, Muslim rage is a term that was coined by Bernard Lewis um, back in uh, 1990s. And it's really taken over. And I think if you can think, you know, there's no context often put in when you, when you see images like this, of the politics of the, you know, what's going on. If you imagine the past week or so, um, images of Northern Ireland have been spread across the world. They've been in Iraq, they've been in Jordan, they've been in Turkey. Um, and if we if they title Christian rage because it's Muslims fighting Christian Catholics. So, you know, that's the lack of context that we often see in the media. So I'm going to ask you to hold your assumptions lightly, to quote, quote a friend of mine, um, because it's very easy to see the world as a binary. Sorry, my, 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 my computer just went blank. Um, it's very easy to see um, the world as a binary between a very black and white view of everything. Um, Christian, Christianity is peaceful, tolerant, or whatever your other religion is. Islam is violent and intolerant, or vice versa. That both are inherently one thing or the other, blue prints etched in stone. And, and unfortunately, um, People can be violent, yeah. There are violence, I'm not going to, I'm not here to deny that. Um, and people will dress that violence up um, in all manner of causes, be that communism, Brexit, Christianity, Islam, any issue that people think is bigger than themselves. And I would say at the start, no religion is inherently peaceful or inherently violent, nor is it anything other than its followers make it out to be. The Quran teaches us to stand out firmly for justice as witnesses to God. And so we strive to speak truthfully about one another's faith and respect each community's interpretation of themselves, not to compare the best interpretation and practice of our faith with the worst interpretation and practice of others. So I'd ask you to be discerning in how media and literature portray the other. And many stereotypes can be challenged by exploring context and meaning beyond simplistic narratives. And two documentaries I'd really recommend. They're not specifically about Islam, although it's mentioned in one of them. Adam Curtis documentary, um, Odearism, which is about our news cycle and Power of Nightmares, which really explains the rise of sort of extremism in, in, um, in the world and this, how that's benefited certain political powers. Um, so I'm in the process of all that, I <laughs> skipped some slides. Um, so in the West, Islam has often been viewed from Orientalist lens. Edward Said described Naomi. 
Now, yeah. there's two there's two black bars on your screen there. I'm not sure how that came up. Is that only for me? Or can you see it? Is, is anybody else? I have that as well, yeah. No, I can see it too now, yeah. Maybe stop sharing and reshare again. Okay, sorry, maybe I don't know. My computer went blank and then I went back. So uh, sorry about that. Thanks for pointing out. Um, is that any better? Have yeah. we still got lines? Okay, so I apologize. For that. Sorry, Naomi, could you just say the names of those two um, documentaries you mentioned it's, again? Uh, it's Adam Adam Curtis is the, the, the who did them. So there's Odearism. And then the other one is the power of nightmares. And that's that's specifically about the rise of Islamism and neoliberalism and, you know, how those two um, have really clashed. Thank you. Um, and, and so they're, they're very interesting, just an insight um, into <clears throat> the rise of certain things. So um, apologies for all the interruption. Um, this is recorded for posterity, so you get to see all the technical hitches. Um, so... Uh, you know, there's this presumption of difference and um, there's application of cliched stereotypes and inaccurate cultural representations that can often form the foundations of Western thought and the perception of the East, particularly the Middle East and Islam. Islam is viewed as inherently unchanging, uncompromising and backwards. And I'm here to tell you today that's that's not really the case. And of course, one of the big things and a big debate, certainly in the literature, um, and in the, in the media is this idea that Islam is incompatible with the West. And it, it, this narrative is really pushed by Samuel Huntington, Huntington um, with his clash of civilizations um, hypothesis, which is put forward by him and, and on others since. Um, and I don't believe that to be true. I believe coexistence is actually inherently part of Islam and has been part of the history of Islam, particularly as practiced um, in history. So what is Islam? So, of course, at first, maybe it seems like a completely new and alien religion. We consider it as a continuation of other religions um, with new revelations building on existing traditions. Um, it's, it was first um, founded in Mecca, which was a trading hub where different religions um, uh, were centered. The polytheists are, were the dominant force um, at that time. Um, and Muhammad was one of was one of them. He started preaching in Mecca, and um, that there was only one God, the jo the God of the Jews and the Christians, and was persecuted for that. And um, he then migrated to Medina, and these are times you maybe heard Mecca, Medina in the news, and and this is their significance in Islam. So Medina was where the Prophet migrated to, um, and it's um, in, in in a move called Al Hijra, and he continued the message there. He set up a community. Um, which wasn't exclusively Muslim. There were Jewish tribes and other tribes as part of that community. And then eventually he returned to Mecca and removed the statues. Um, they fought with the, the polyatists and because um, they prevented them coming back. Um, so they had a fight, they broke some a contract. They came back and they removed the statues around the Kaaba. And that's what people call this black box in the desert. It's not a black box in the desert. It's an actual building, um, which they um, traditions believe that was originally built by Abraham um, and that area is the desert of Paran, or um, which is mentioned in the Bible, where Hagar and her son Ishmael came and found water um, whenever they um, left um, because of um, his other wife. Uh, central to Islam, um, of course, is the Quran. Muslims believe that the Quran was revealed um, through the Archangel Gabriel um, incrementally over a period of 23 years, beginning when Muhammad was 40 years old and concluding the year of his death. Um, it's a little bit, you know, different from previous scriptures. It refers to the Bible and historical um, narratives, but it's not it's not a storybook. Um, it gives sort of a more general outlines of these stories that would have already been well known to the people um, and, and to the Jews and the Christians and the people of the area. But the focus is really on the lesson. So it'll mention, it will not say, you know, like in the Bible, you'll have a story of Noah and the sort of chronology. Um, chronology of how that story happened it'll say like think about Noah and this is the lesson that that, that comes from that so it's it's really focused on the the, the lesson and not the story um, another thing that confuses people a little bit is you know there's 20 at least 24 different individuals who are mentioned in the Quran referencing um, the Bible but their names are derived from the original uh, Hebrew and Aramaic so sometimes it, it's different from the sort of Hellenized um, names that we are familiar with in English you know Jesus was not called Jesus in his original tongue but that's that's how it's been come down to us the Latin texts so that can sometimes um, confuse people and one of the big ones obviously is the name for God Allah 
Um, and the language of the Assyrian Christians is uh, Eli, and you, you know this from, if you if you know the Easter narrative in the Christianity, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani, um, Allah, Allah is the same, same root. Um, so Arabic speakers, whether they're Jews or Christians or Muslims, they all use the word Allah to mean God. Um, now I'm going to get a little bit into the diversity. There's a lot of diversity in Islam, but um, regardless of what sect you belong to, there is a central um, creed, um, which is really agreed upon. Um, now the details of this vary greatly between um, the different sects, but um, we all agree on the six points. Um, so there's central belief is the belief in God the oneness specifically the oneness of god there is one god he created the world he's the god of uh, adam isaac jacob um ishmael uh, jesus and he created the world and we all um are uh, responsible to him and part of that then is the shahada which you might have heard people say la ilaha illallah there is no god but god uh, and muhammad is the prophet of god <clears throat> and this is kind of um also has a kind of um, uh, would sort of remind you, maybe if you know the uh, hero Israel, the Lord or God is one, which is Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. So there's that kind of continuation, God is one. And um, also belief in angels, not to worship, but that their existence. So we've got, you know, Jibreel, Gabriel, um, Michael, Michael, um, uh, Raphael and, and different archangels that um, we believe in them. The belief in God's revealed books, obviously the Quran, um, but also recognizing that God previously revealed himself in um, the Torah, in the Psalms, in the gospel of Jesus as originally revealed. So they'll not accept that um, the Bible as it's written was the original, but that those books were originally from God, <clears throat> even if they have been changed. Also belief that God sent messengers, Adam, Moses, Aaron, Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, Jacob, Jesus, and Muhammad. All sent by God, but not divine. There is no belief that Muhammad is not our God. Muhammad is not the son of God. Um, he was a man who was sent to preach about God. <clears throat> belief in the day of judgment, pretty self-explanatory. And lastly, the belief in the Qadr of Allah. Um, this is sometimes mistranslated as predestination, but it's it's not predestination. It, it's that God has knowledge of everything um, that will be, but humans have freedom of choice. And then the actions. So we have five pillars. You might have heard five pillars of Islam. And this is what we Muslims should be doing. In reality, many people who identify as Muslims will do some of these or some will do none of these. Um, so <clears throat> again, a lot of these have parallels in, in the earlier traditions. So we've had the Shahada, which was related to that belief, the oneness of God, um, which is called Tawid. Um, we've also got the prayer. A lot of you might know about the five daily prayers, which we call Salah. Um, so that's done in Fajr, which is the morning prayer. Then there's Duhr, which is the midday prayer. Then there's Asr, which is the afternoon prayer. There's Maghrib, which is the sunset prayer. And then there's Isha, which is the nighttime prayer. Um, and there's two types. So that's the formal ritualized worship. And I like to compare that to maybe the liturgy in some of the, you know, the Anglican or the Catholic traditions. It's a, it's a community form of worship. Um, it's a time of you, you take a break from your day to remember God. Um, but everywhere, you know, at some point, oh, somewhere because of the times, it's all calculated to the local time of the sun. So, um, and the type of that's how they calculated the days back then. Uh, the time of the day was the position of the sun. So it changes certainly up here in, in the north. Um, it changes quite dramatically from summer to winter. Near the equator, there's less of a difference. And, um, but at some point, there is a Muslim praying uh, the ritual prayer, the Salah, um, across the world. Um, we turn to towards Mecca to pray towards the Qibla, the, the little um, black build. Uh, it's actually a stone building that's covered in black cloth and um, with gold embroidery. So we, we turn towards that in prayer. <clears throat> and this is a sign of the spiritual unity of Muslims at the time of prayer. And those the physical movements. We stand, we bow and we prostrate. Um, and this would have been a very familiar form of prayer to the um, Jewish tribes in the 17th century and the Orthodox Christians. Um, and some, some of the Jewish sects and early Christians, the Copts and uh, Eastern, Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox can almost speak, um, sects still include 
um, prostration in their ritual prayers. There's also given of Saqqa, which is kind of an early welfare system. Um, all those Muslims with means have to give a percentage of their income to charity, which is then distributed among the poor. Um, there's also sadaqa, which is a free will offering, which is really encouraged as well. So you've got your obligatory, you know, you give this percentage, 2.5% of your wealth every year, and you also give in charity sadaqa. <clears throat> um, we have to fast. This is Ramadan started yesterday for some, today for some others, depending on, on the method that they follow. Um, and that's fasting from, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but fasting from dawn to dusk from month from food, water, um, sexual activities, um, smoking, a couple of other things. Um, and it's really to strengthen our willpower and appreciate what we have and to sympathize with the poor. And it's not just Ramadan, there are other sort of key days throughout the year that people may fast. And last but not least, the pilgrimage to Mecca. Every uh, Muslim should go at least um, once a lifetime. Um, as I said, it's, it's not just a black box in the desert. It is um, a structure built by Ibrahim um, and the surrounding um, area um, is, has a number of rites associated with it, um, including the well, which we believe that um, God provided for Hagar and Ishmael. Um, when they went to the desert and that, that's called Zamzam uh, and it's that well is still flowing. Um, so back to the Quran a little bit um, it's revealed in Arabic um, it's preserved in text and memory so there are across the world there are thousands hundreds and thousands of people who have committed the entire book to memory in Arabic. Um, it's a single text we use worldwide. There's some differences in versions in terms of punctuation and things, but the actual Arabic core text is the same. It's universal and it's considered the word of God. It has been translated in two different languages, um, but these are interpretations. And sometimes these are heavily influenced by the translator um, and they've put their additions sometimes in brackets, sometimes in italics, sometimes in notes. Um, Additional commentary is called a tafsir, particularly when it's a separate commentary, but sometimes that has actually been incorporated into the text and that can lead to, um, you know, if you read a start, some versions I would never touch in English because to me, they, they've just so heavily influenced by, um, and sometimes you see them quoted, look at Islam believes this and you actually go into the original text and it's it's a lot of that is the tafsir of the, of the, um, the translator has put that within the text. Um, there's actually an entire branch of theology dedicated to understanding the reason and context of the revelation. So it's not just, it's in the text, that's the way it is. There's a, there is actually um, a lot of um, interpretation there. Um, context matters. There are context dependent verses, which are unambiguous and timeless, and, there, and they can be applied to every situation. But there are also context dependent verses, which are specifically for time and place and cannot be let, read in isolation. There's also the Sunnah traditions and um, the practice of Muhammad. These are primarily found in what we call the Hadith, um, which are collections and sayings of the Prophet and early companions. They were collected after Muhammad's passing, originally through oral traditions, and then eventually written down and, and, and compiled into collections. Again, they can't be read in isolation. And there's an entire theological political science dedicated to understanding Hadith because they're different classifications and different, you know, are they, some of them are fabricated, some of them are valid, some of them, the chain isn't signed, what they call a sign chain, just as in the oral people, like this person, if someone was shown to be a liar, for example, then that chain is seen to be, um, uh, unreliable and also if it contradicts something in the Quran or something fundamental to Islamic belief and um, then it, you know the, it's particularly in the Hanafi school they will um, discount it so there's a lot of variations between madhab which we'll go into in a second um, and different sects and uh, so they some like the Shia and Sunni have different collections of hadith so what a, a madhab is basically the school of thought um, within Islamic jurisprudence or fiqh so there are four main Sunni schools, um, and then there are little tiny little branches off those as well. So there's no single um, Islamic um, school. And so there is variation in, in among Islam. So I'm not here to tell you this is Islam in a nice, neat, neat, neatly made package because there's, although we have the core beliefs, 
there is a lot of variation. So if you come and say, well, this scholar said, blah, blah, blah. I want to know where he is, he, where is he from? What's his, what's his mouth hub? What's his qualifications? It doesn't, it's not enough to say somebody said this um, because I get that thrown at me a lot. And I'm like, who is he? I don't know if I'm Adam. <laughs> um, so there's, there's a great, um, great debate and variation on points of Islamic law or fiqh. And there's this um, ijama, which is the consensus of this, or the agreement of the Islamic scholars um, that is often used to say, well, the majority of scholars say this, but even that term itself is contested. Um, so, <laughs> um, I'm not here to give you nice neat answers because unfortunately it's not that easy. Um, there are different opinions and interpretation which account for varying practices among Muslims. And recognize, regardless of which matab one subscribes to, we recognize that laws are interpreted, interpreted by human beings and we are fallible in nature. Uh, and when that's why often when someone gives a religious opinion, we often hear Allah wa alam, or God knows best, because it's not necessarily as binding as you would like to think. The Sharia is a notorious term. Um, it's um, often translated as law, um, but the root word in Arabic means shar, um, means a path, particularly a path to water. Um, and in Islam, metaphors using the natural world are really, really common because um, they resonate with people. And just as the path leads to water to replenish the body, God's path can direct us to, to the way of the soul. So there's no book called Sharia. There's no book called Sharia law. It's Islamic theology based on different interpretations, different madhabs and schools of thought. It was established in the early um, years of Islam, which is a couple of hundred years after um, Muhammad. Um, and they're the way meaning was produced. But there are five main objectives. To uphold the faith, um, <clears throat> to protect life, to protect intellect, protect the lineage. So, you know, if you have a, a child, you should know who its parents are and protect property. And that's the five key um, things that any interpretation should come through. As I said, different, different interpretations. Um, so a, a scholar will produce a fatwa, which is again, very notorious thanks to Salman Rushdie, but it's actually in reality, a non-binding opinion on a point of Islamic law given by a qualified jurist. So if just because it's a fatwa doesn't mean everyone will follow it again. Where does that come from? What's the authority? What's the, the meaning behind it? And you can get different fatwa completely opposing each other. And actually in traditional sort of orthodox Islam that wasn't considered. Um, an issue. Um, there's a well-known saying that say, states that differences among scholars are God's mercy, for they allow for different conditions and temperaments among people. And this is an example of how many <laughs> the version here. So we've got 80% of all Muslims um, are, are the Sunni branch and 20% are Shia. And that split came from after Muhammad died and um, he was followed by a series of caliphs. Um, the Shia followed his son-in-law, Ali, and the Sunnis believe there were four caliphs, so, and Ali was the fourth. So it's a political, it's largely a political um, division originally, but the, that has developed now because they've, they've developed different schools. So there are theological differences, but initially it was a political difference. Um, we hear a lot about, you know, Saudi Arabia, and I think it's really important to state here, Saudi Arabia is a new country. It was founded in 1920s um, with the help of the British. Um, it's not, they're not the theological, um, we don't have Vatican, we don't have a Pope. Saudi Arabia is not um, our you know, spiritual home as, as such. The, the, the places are Mecca and Medina are, but just because Saudi says it doesn't mean all Muslims follow it. So most uh, Saudis would be uh, a branch of the Hanabali which is a, one of the four matabs, but the majority of Muslims, as you can see here, are Shafi, Maliki or Hanafi. So there's, there, you know, there's, there are a minority within a minority, really. <clears throat> so it's a little bit quickly because we're in Ramadan. Um, Muslims have a 12, a different calendar from the Gregorian calendar. It's, it's a lunar calendar and um, begins when the new moon appears and uh, ends when it uh, finishes. Moon is not a sacred symbol in Islam. It's just a marker of a calendar and it became affiliated with Islam because the Ottoman Empire took on the flag of Constantinople at the time, which was a star and a crescent. And it, the Ottoman Empire was the largest and longest running empire in the world. and took over a large part of the Muslim world. 
so-called, and that's really why it's associated. But in itself, we don't worship the moon. We don't have any holy significance to the moon other than it marks our month. <coughs> oh, keep pressing. We're in Ramadan now. So this is the ninth Islamic month. Uh, we fast, I'm currently fasting. Camilla is currently fasting um, between dawn and sunset. So we eat a small meal called Suhur, if we get up as we should, um, eat Suhur, pray Fajr, um, and then we fast um, all day. <clears throat> and we'll break it up Maghrib, which tonight is I think 8.27, um, with a small meal, just have a little bit of water and dates, and then you would have your meal after. Children are not expected to fast. Some do like to try. My nine-year-old is desperate to try and fast. And I'm telling her, you know, you need your brain for school. And um, especially in the West here, because people then think you're child abuse. And, you know, there's a lot of social pressures there. Um, but to, to, they really want to be like the family. They want to try it. Um, if you're pregnant, if you're menstruating, if you're traveling any uh, over 80 kilometers, if you're sick, um, if you're elderly, you're exempt from fasting. But again, there is that sometimes you'll find people who are in these situations who want to fast because they feel it's like I don't want to miss out so you will find people who do this in those situations but they're not they're actually exempt um there's also a lot of confusion because you're not meant to take anything basically past the throat um so there's especially around covid and um, some people think because any vaccines maybe would break your fast but um you're allowed to get COVID tests, you're allowed to get COVID vaccines, you're allowed to take your asthma inhaler, you're allowed to take insulin injections, um, putting things on your skin is fine. Um, it's no nutrients are allowed to come, so you can't have like a, a vitamin injection, but you could have um, your, your normal vaccines. Um, in normal times, obviously with COVID, there's changes here, but um, every night during Ramadan, there are special prayers in mosques, um, and it's usually the men go because Unfortunately, women tend to be at home with the kids, um, but they are certainly in BIC allowed to come. Um, their night prayers, um, which are shortened at the moment, where we are allowed to open, um, usually can go on for over an hour. And, and the, the, the Quran is read over the course of Ramadan. And um, the last 10 days of Ramadan are particularly sacred. Um, and Laylat al-Qadr, which is the night of power, which is believed to be the night that the Quran was revealed, will fall at one of those nights, but it's not known. We don't know what night it is. We're just told to, to, to really make an extra effort those last 10 days. And then after Ramadan, we have Eid al-Fitr, which is the breaking of the fast. Um, and then, so there's, this is our main uh, holidays. So about two months later, we'll have the Hajj season, um, which is a ritual which is pro provide, um done around the holy city the largest gathering of human beings on earth um and so it's, it's usually about two months from now um and that will be sort of the Eid al Adha, which is the second the greatest um Eid is in the middle of that um celebration and that's in commemoration of um whenever God calls Ibrahim to sacrifice his son as a sign of faith and provide a lamb instead um, again in commemoration and um, people will sacrifice a sheep or a, an animal um, and then distribute that among the poor we don't believe that the, that has any you know that in itself is and we're not like giving a sacrifice to god as such but we're asked to, to commemorate abraham's sacrifice uh, and give to the poor here in europe that's not usually possible obviously we don't have sheep on and um, in our living rooms uh or in our, our roofs or in our gardens so uh, we do that remotely we tend to give money to a charity abroad who will do that for the most needy both Eid festivals are marked by an Eid prayer, which is when everyone gets together in congregation. In Northern Ireland, we usually hire, our mosques aren't big enough, so we hire a hall, maybe two, 3,000 people will come together. Um, and it, sometimes we have to do it because the numbers, we have to do it in like kind of stages. Uh, and we offer prayer in congregation, give out sweets, you visit your friends and family when it's not COVID, and you give to charity. Um, in Northern Ireland, there, as I said, diversity, diversity, um, big thing here. In Northern Ireland, there are at least 48 different national backgrounds among the Muslim community. There's over 24 different languages spoken among the Muslim community. Um, there are currently nine uh, centres in Northern Ireland. None of them are purpose-built mosques. They're mainly converted houses or hired halls or businesses. Most only offer a place, a place to pray, sometimes only on a Friday, sometimes only certain times. Um, not all Muslims will attend a place of worship, not all Muslims want to, 
it's not necessarily an indication that it's someone's faith is unimportant. There can be different reasons for that. It's not close, it's not near. Certainly it's not an obligation on women to go, they are permitted to go. Um, but there's an understanding maybe they have, um, it is difficult with children. Um, so um, another thing people wonder, why we tend to segregate men and women? Um, and again, that's because of, as I said, the physical nature of the prayer, we're bowing. And a lot of people appreciate that privacy because it is a very physical act. Um, so we tend to divide between men and women. It's not an indication that women are any less. I said last week, I'm gonna just touch on some of the more controversial things. I'm literally two more things and I'm passing you on to the next, the next thing. So um, weddings, celebrations, again, will vary. We've got some very diverse pictures on the side there, um, but there's a couple of, of criteria. You must be of age, you must give consent, forced marriage is not an Islamic marriage. Um, informal Islamic marriage is not legally recognised in the UK. There's no paperwork. It's not seen in law as a marriage. You're just a cohabiting couple. Some people do, they have a little ceremonies and whatever, but if they're not registered, they're not married according to the law. Belfast Islamic Centre has Muslim registrars who can conduct legal um, ceremony like register for City Hall with Islamic rights. And again, despite what you might hear in the news, um, there is no Islamic divorce in the UK and um, you can only get divorced via the, the county or high court and then you know an Islamic authority can stamp that there are organizations that work as kind of um, reconciliation or whatever but they have no authority on this um, and again woman I stuck a picture of the hijab there I don't really want to talk about hijab because I think women are always reduced to a scarf and um, this little cartoon names for things changed depending on culture and with the sort of rise of Instagram and, and YouTube and everything like styles of hijab are kind of cross-cultural now and um, so and they're not necessarily an accurate portrayal um, but I think I, I still want to touch on these sort of controversial things again these are subjects I could go into in more detail but I'm literally going to touch on these things if you encounter this this is not true so someone tells you and sometimes it'll be a man tell you he's allowed to hit his wife he's not um, uh, there is no excuse for abuse in Islam whoever strikes someone will receive retribution for it on the day of resurrection and Allah will torture those who torture people in this world <clears throat> FGM FGM, female genital mutilation, it's an ancient practice originated in um, pre-Islamic times. It has continued throughout, unfortunately, um, the Islamic era in some regions. It's not practiced in most majority Muslim countries, um, such as Pakistan, India, Bangladesh. Um, it's not even known in a lot of these countries. It's not an Islamic group. Um, there's no evidence in the family of the Holy Prophet was circumcised, as they call it, or mutilated. And I think it's also important to note that Western organisations often get credit for the fight against FGM. And it's not just FGM, women's rights in general. But we need to give credit to the local campaigners who are leading the way on this, who are often Muslim women themselves. And there's some Muslim women here in Northern Ireland and in Ireland who are campaigning against FGM. And we need to give credit to those and give them voice um, and give them a platform because they are they are the real they are the real um, champions here. Special <clears throat> one, like I said, this is just a whistle stop tour because we don't have a lot of time. So I'm, I'm touching on these issues unsaid. Um, honor killing. There is no honor in honor killing. There is no Islamic punishment for shame caused upon a family by their female, imagine shame, by their female relations or male relations. There's no concept of restoring family honor by killing someone. But unfortunately, it can be a cultural phenomenon. Um, divorce is permitted in Islam for women and men, but there are sometimes cultural taboos. So um, some people will not want to because of pressure, but it is permitted within Islam for a woman to, to divorce. It's said it's, um, it's the least liked, so you're, it's, it should be a last resort, but it's a woman's right to get divorced, particularly if a husband is abusive. And that's where we're really coming on to the next segment here, because there are no Muslim countries. There are rather Muslim majority countries. There's no central authority or patriarch in Islam. Islam and Muslims are very diverse. There's no single culture. There are multiple Muslim cultures. How a Muslim practices his or her faith is influenced by many factors. Their local culture, which is often the strongest influence, their sect, 
their personal conviction, family influences, class, gender, education level and religious knowledge. Social practice such as dress, marriage, celebrations, food, these all differ uh, something quite vastly. We'll just hold the fort till we get Naomi back in um, with us. I think she was having a wee bit of interference there. Um, she was kind of freezing a wee bit. We can we can start with the next presentation until Naomi comes back and then we can pick up from that. Is that okay? No problem. That's fine, Camilla. Thank you. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to put them in the chat box. We are joined today. So as you have seen, there's a lot of differences when it comes um, to what is cultural and what is religious. And part of that is how, uh, as Naomi said, how what people do. There's a lot of things that I would do just the same way as ethnic minorities, Black and ethnic minorities themselves are not a homogeneous group. Even within Islam, within, within the Muslim community, there's so many different sects. There's so many different people who would do different things. And it's not per se about the religion, it's about the cultural uh, rituals that they would do. Even when, it, despite that we would all go to the same mosque, there's a lot of intersectionality within those. We are joined today by three guest speakers uh, who will tell us a bit about their journey, what they have gone through, uh, their journey to Northern Ireland. We have two, uh, we have Safa and Hassan, who would be talking about their journey to Northern Ireland. What has helped for them? Who has been there? How have professionals dealt with them? And then we will have Avril, who has had, uh, who has been absolutely amazing in her contribution and working for her organization in supporting Syrian families, the first cohort that come and ever since then. Naomi, you are back. Sorry, at what point did I drop out? Because I just continued. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think it, um, you were talking about yeah, the central, the central authority. Okay, okay, right, let's see. Let me get back then. I was, I was all right. It was my last slide anyway, so um, I can't screen share again because I've been kicked out. Can you let me screen share? So apologies. This is great. Um, technical um hitches today. Um, so yeah, I was, I, I've really just summarizing there to go to go on that there's no single muslim culture there are multiple muslim cultures and you know how a muslim practices their faith will be influenced by so many factors particularly local culture which is why we've got camilla for the next segment and um, sect personal convictions and um, your um family influences class gender education level religious knowledge and um, for example the social practices how women dress um, how men dress, your marriage celebrations, your food, they all differ within Muslims. And that's why I'm, I didn't really want to focus on those aspects today. Um, but there are the key beliefs and practices that are largely shared. And that's what I've hopefully covered in the talk today. So now I'm going to pass on to Camilla because I tried to do this earlier and I just saw a frozen screen and was very confused. So now I'm going to pass on to Camilla and her guests to talk about more of the cultural side um, and the practical aspects of living in Northern Ireland. Um, so thank you, you well, thank you very much Naomi we actually actually if any of you have any questions for Naomi if you want to raise your hand up or uh, unmute yourself I know there's be comments there in the chat box from Christine my impression is that like uh, the middle of the road silent majority here in Northern Ireland Muslim are not so good at speaking out in public about the reality of being a Muslim so only the worst behaviors reach us and I just challenge that because I do nothing but speak out everyone I know does nothing but speak out we don't always have the platform and I wouldn't blame the Muslims for not speaking out because you meet a Muslim and find me a Muslim in Northern Ireland that supports ISIS please find me one because I've never met one in 15 years and the, the issue is necessarily the platform or your opportunity to speak to us. It's not us not speaking out. So, and again, I said, like, look at that very first slide when I said, whenever I Google Islam, it takes me to the second page before I get to Muslims. That's, I didn't invent Google. I didn't invent Bing. It's not, you know, we don't have the platform to have these conversations. And I think that's, um, thank you to Lisa for inviting us. That's why I said at the beginning, thank you, Lisa, for inviting me because we don't always get the opportunity. We do in our own in BIC, we have many talks, but that doesn't reach often the people who need to hear that, hear this the most. Um, 
uh, yeah, I could go into that about funding and stuff, but we'll not. So Camilla, on this you go. Is, <laughs> this is also something that we'll be touching uh, later on during those workshops about who is it that we're giving a platform to and whose voice we are amplifying. Paul, you have a question there? Hello, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, happy days. Yeah, um, so I suppose just off the back of what you said there, I do think it is important that um, Muslims and people from other faith traditions are given um, platforms like this one. But I think it's also important, I would say probably the majority of us that have signed up for this program um, are the people that least need to hear it. Um, showed an interest and a want. Um, so I think it's up to organisations probably to um, make things like this obligatory for their staff. Um, so those that maybe wouldn't sign up um, are hearing the message or getting the opportunity to meet people that they maybe wouldn't um, and hear their stories. A hundred percent, Paul. Um, I think that's a big issue. I mean, I've applied for funding before to try and do something where we would be going out to the most, you know, those communities that are the most scared of us. Because I'm, I'm one of those people, like, ask me anything, I'll answer. Um, and we were refused because we weren't bringing Catholics and Protestants together. They're not interested in Muslims going and speaking um, to, you know, communities that are challenging because they're not, you know, the way our funding works here, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But that, that's something I, I firmly believe. Um, and we need to be enabled to do that. Um, and I'm, you know, me and myself and Camilla and others are very, very keen to do that kind of thing because I think it's only by talking that we understand each other and break down some of those stereotypes and barriers. And that again works two ways. It's not just a one way, a yeah. one way thing. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I also had a question on the uh, so probably slightly contradictory to that was um, in terms of us being the least likely or the least in need of hearing this. Um, uh, I also, I, I don't know everything and I will profess to know everything. And I also know that I, I hold certain biases. Um, one of the things that you'd mentioned previously was women are um, se separate from men in the mosque and it's not because they are seen as any lesser. Um, uh, there is, correct me if I'm wrong, um, I obviously, I don't read Arabic and so I don't know the Arabic translation, um, but there is something within the Quran that states that um, men are in charge of women, isn't there? It says that men are the maintainers and protectors of women, so they're not in charge. Protector okay. is different that term so it's uh, I think it's, it's particularly you got to understand this is coming in the context of 11th century Arabia where there's constant war but women and I, I know it myself when I was pregnant we have a lot of ch changes here we have maternity pay but you're so women when they're pregnant when they have children are vulnerable that is a physical reality of life mm -hmm. so if you don't have a system where you have maternity pay where you, you need so there's basically within the religion there is you, if you produce a baby with a woman, <laughs> shall we say, you're married to a woman, you're responsible for that child for as, you know, to pay maintenance and to look after the mother as well as the child. So that was a, so you, a man is responsible for his children as long as they are um, underage and for the mother of the child. Um, so that was an almost an early system. So yes, they are protectors and maintainers, but that's just recognizing that there is a difference between men and women. It's not saying that men are, are better than women. And actually most of the Quran refers to men and women, you know, believers, men and women. Um, and that is very much true. Now there is, it is true. Um, patriarchy is, you know, in, in different cultures, it is, sometimes it's quite strong. And um, there were actually women jurists and scholars throughout the history of Islam, there were hundreds of thousands of them teaching men and, and that doesn't really happen now. And that's because of you know, changes and that's really only happened over the past 100 or 200 years. But for, for a thousand years before, there were female scholars. So there is there's certainly been cultural changes, but it's not necessarily a religious change. But in terms of, do I believe the Quran says women are less than men? No, they don't. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that's pretty clear um, in that. Um, yeah, Christian faith yes. says that First Corinthians eleven. Yeah. There is, but that's a slightly different. It's different. It does. Religion. It makes sense what you're saying in terms of the context of the time. I think in the Bible it says as well 
that women should be quiet in church. Yeah, well, we're not told to be quiet, which is really so, hard. The <laughs> context of women being told to be quiet in church was to yeah, be... Yeah, yeah, so first, the first Corinthians 11, there's quite a lot of text um, in that. But yeah, this, this is um, a lot of that actually how things are at the moment are, are relatively recent, particularly since um, there was some reformist movements in mm -hmm. the 18th century, um, mainly Saudi Arabia, um, also a small um, in, in India um, to fight the British, the Diabandi mm -hmm. movement, and they have influenced um, mm -hmm. how, how Islam is practiced today, but that's not always how it was practiced over the, over yeah. the century, so it's important to note that as well. Well, it's, it's great um, just in terms of even hearing the, the different translation I think it makes sense in terms of what yeah. you said earlier and the, the other the other one is that the, the people bring bring up this the beating verse you know that and it's there's a translation in English it says you know you can beat your woman and it says in brackets lightly beat them lightly or something um, and the word is daraba which is to go out to strike the ground so it, it tells you know if you have a problem with your wife you you leave her bed you leave the house so a daraba is to strike the ground as you leave her mm -hmm. but some people have translated that word to strike the ground as to strike your wife. Mm -hmm. So that's another example with an interpretation. And when people show you this verse and you're like, what? And then you, there's actually, there is alternative, you know, when, especially when you go into the linguistics, you know, it is, uh, Arabic is a very rich language. Mm -hmm. It is root words. And, you know, and, and that's why I would say, you know, this, there's, you could study a lifetime, the text, and you still wouldn't have the full understanding um, yeah. of the religion. Yeah, thank you that, very much. You. Thank Sorry. you very much, Naomi. We'll, we'll get we'll introduce the guest speakers now, and we'll keep a lot of the questions uh, for the end, just to make sure that we are within the time. To start off with, we have Safa. Safa, can you unmute yourself uh, and your video? Well, thank Hello, you so Safa. much. Thank you so yeah. much for joining us, Safa. Thank you. Safa, we are very delighted to have you today. So what we be asking is a bit about your journey to Northern Ireland, how you came here and what you saw, the culture shock that you had, seeing different people, different things. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, hi, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Safa Adjani from Sudan. I came here in Belfast uh, maybe three months ago. Sorry for my broken English. <laughs> and what has what has that journey been like for you, being here in Northern Ireland, being away from home? And okay, uh, traveling to here Belfast uh, is not something that we... you can turn okay. your video off if you want. If that makes it easier, yeah, yeah. Is that better? Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's good. Yeah. Go on. Sorry, you can keep. You can keep going. Go on. Uh, as I as I as I said, um, I faced some problem here uh, there over there in my country. So my journey is not uh, quite. Maybe it's not cool as much, but uh, maybe. But I'm so glad to be here. And I guess it could be a new chapter in my life here in Southwest. I know, and someone, there's a big comment there, but they we understand that it's not very easy to communicate whenever you're uh, in a different language when you're not used to it. And I know that you have been doing yeah. a lot of different courses. Tell us a bit about those courses that you've been doing, learning different things. Okay, uh, uh, when, I, uh, when I came here, there is like uh, many organization or authorities that helped me a lot. Uh, the first one is like um, uh, the Red Cross and the Home Office. Also, there are people there working there. It's so polite. Um, and help me help me a lot in like uh, a GP. I don't know. I don't have any idea before I came here. I don't have anyone who helps me. Okay. Um. Um. Also, there is um one thirty three organization here that also 
helped help me a lot. Um, do you know what we'll do, Safa? We'll, we'll come back to questions in a bit. Thank you very much. If you wait a, uh, a bit there, we'll come back to questions and answers from people. I'm going to um, introduce Hassan. I am. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Hi, Hassan. Thank you so much for joining us there. And uh, I'm not really sure if any of you have seen Hassan. He was recently in the papers and there was a lot of talk about the amazing work that Hassan has been done, has been doing. So, Hassan, thank you so much for coming on. If you want to tell us a bit about your journey uh, to Northern Ireland and what has that been like. Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for having me today here. Um, I'm so sorry, I'm a bit nervous, <laughs> but anyway, I'll get it go. Um, firstly, I'd like to talk about my, you know, using the, sorry, just using the chance to talk about myself a little bit. Um, my name is Hassan al Khawam. I'm originally from Syria. Um, in 2013, we had to leave Syria, we had to flee the war. Uh, we moved to Jordan, we stayed there like four years and a half, and then we came here. Uh, we came uh, through the special program, the settlement, um, personal, uh, vulnerable personal settlement scheme. Um, the journey started with the English. Um, the English was the, f the first barrier in, in this country. Uh, as, you, as you know, that you know, newcomer doesn't have any English, who just knew just you know, a few words, um, just had to say hello, and you know, how are you? you just, just to open on conversation, but you don't have the end point of the conversation. And I actually didn't work it here at all because, you know, whenever I came here, you know, the first person I met, he was saying like, wow. And I was like, what are you saying? You know, like, or like the other one was, what the crack? And I was like, it's not, it's not English, you know? So I was like, okay, here you go. We have to start from the zero and um, learning new uh, language and, you know, planning for the future. So the first step was English. So to get, you know, to improve yourself in English, you need to practice, you need to do like, you know, theoretical things and practical things, which is, you know, learning new words, vocabularies, um, grammars, and then, you know, uh, practicing with uh, people from here locally. Because if you study English without practicing with uh, people from here, no, no possible, because you learn things and you hear from the street something else. Um, so I started looking for resources to, uh, to improve my English. Uh, well, let me just use this opportunity to thank uh, Judith Atwell, who was the first helper in the first, uh, in the, in the first stages. Uh, who was the key worker for our family. As you know, whenever you come here as a Syrian family, you get a key worker uh, who help you. So she put me uh, on a college, on Dorgan College uh, to study English. And then I started to look, you know, for other places because one or two hours a week, two hours a week is nothing for somebody who wants, you know, to, to get a good life here. So I started to look for um, resources. So. I started with YouTube channels, uh, BBC Learning, also a website online. Um, also, uh, Belfast Met. I applied for Belfast Met, and we at the beginning we said we're not, we're not, we're not gonna make. I mean, I'm not gonna make it. I'm not gonna go there because like far away. Because I live in Logan, uh, which is like 20, 28 miles far away from Belfast Met, so it's, it's kind of ridiculous. But I made it. I had to go there. And the last place was, or two places also, uh, Osman Center and the um, um, Emmanuel Church. So six places uh, with a lot of work, um, but you know, eventually hard work pay off. Uh, so the the English started from that from that point actually. I did my best just to improve myself because at the beginning I just wanted you know to speak. And then whenever I started to, to, speak, to speak and I got, you know, the confidence to speak with others, uh, I was like, okay, what's, what's my plan for the future? I'm still young. And uh, I obviously thought, you know, when I was, when I was in Jordan, I started, uh, I studied um, software engineering for one year. So, okay, what should I do? So I asked a friend who can, you know, can help me. And he, and she, you know, pointed out like Sam Boston, a person 
who works with the Met, Belfast Met. Uh, her name was Ligia Barisi. She's the best one ever I've ever met here. She was always there whenever I wanted her. Uh, she started the journey with me. Uh, she told me about a course called Future Project. And uh, I did that project, which was about, you know, good, good communication skills between communities and value skills for like, uh, good people and all of this stuff. And I made a lot of friends actually there. Um, um, the, the, the second point was how to get into university. Okay, because I did like software, so I want to continue. So what should I do? Uh, we started asking about what level of English I need to get into university and is my qualification or, you know, um, enough, good enough to get into university or not. So I went to Belfast and to the um, international office, uh, NAREC, and they translated my, well, not, not translated, they equivalent, you know, they did like a, an equivalent for the qualification and they said, brilliant, your qualification is good enough to get into university here, but you just need to ask about the English. So we went asking about English in Belfast, and they, I've been told that uh, level two uh, ESOL would do. I was like, that's fine. I did like an assessment because I, I was doing that at that time. I remember I, I was doing entry level uh, three, which, which was like, you know, very, very low level. Um, so I did like an assessment and I've gotten that assessment like level two. So I was like, dead on, that's great, you know. So I started doing that one, but uh, like I had like a, a question in my mind, would that be acceptable for the university? Well, Belfast Med said, yes, you can, but what about the university? So we gave the university a call and they said, no, we don't accept level two. So, you know, I was disappointed at that point. Um, I was like, okay, that's fine. I'll, I'll do whatever you want. Just tell me, what should I do? Because, you know, I was fed up at that time. I was trying like for a year and a half without getting to university. I mean, I know I am like a new, in a new country, a new language, everything is different. But I mean, I've got all the criteria to get into university apart from the English. And that was, you know, ridiculous for me. So, uh so the, I, I've been told that I need to do IELTS. Uh, so, okay, I need to do IELTS, but I'm short of money. I don't have, you know, I was broke at that time. I didn't have any job. Um, what should I do? So I asked DJ about that and she was like, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna find like funds, no worries about it. So we asked Princess Trust, you know, to, to, to support me towards those stuff, to, you know, to pay the tuition um, fees and the, uh, I'm booking the test as well because there's like a two parts you need to do to do the, the, the exams. The first part is preparation course and the second one is the, the test itself. So to do the preparation, you need to be like 200 something and the, the test 160, which was possible to be paid uh, by me. So uh, I had that help from them, from Princess Trust, but actually they paid only like 170 something. So for the rest of money, for the amount of money, we asked uh, another organization called Review, I, Review Aid. They were fantastic with me. They helped me a lot because I did the test not only once, I did it like a couple of three times and they paid for them, you know. Um, the test wasn't easy at all. It was something really, really hard for me. Uh, the ESOL in this side and the, the test in the other side is completely different. Um, in that sense, you, you, they assessed you like in four components, the reading, speaking, writing, and uh, uh, reading, uh, which was completely hard for me. I did the test the first time. Well, I had to, I had to get like five, uh, six and overall, uh, but I've got 5.5. I did the test three times. I've got the same mark, no improvement, nothing. Uh, so. I went, you know, I tried to talk with the university, they never listened to me. And then, um, yes, I lost a year because of that. So I had to start over again, but I never gave up. I was like, okay, I need to find another way, not only studying English, I need to find a way to get some money. 
So I started uh, to look for a job, which uh, the first job I got was landscaping, which was so hard for me. I, I, I you know, I never uh, worked with heavy stuff, you know, ha you know, ha ha you know, carrying out on those stuff. So I was like, no, it's not, the job is not for me. I got good money, but it wasn't for me. Um, so, and then I moved to a car wash and I did, I did that job. I remember it was so heavy, hard, but I had to, you know, carry on. Uh, to get some money to, 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 to put food on the table. Um, after that, uh, I found like a, an opportunity with Princess Trust to work in retail, uh, to get into retail with Tesco through Princess Trust. So I did like the program. So I worked like for four weeks for like free, uh, four weeks in Tesco. And they gave me the vacancy. I remember that at that day, you know, we were like 20 uh, participants and they, they gave the opportunities for only four people. So I was totally happy, you know, I've got the, the chance to work at Tesco. So I worked at that time, to, you know, to, 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 to gather some money to, to pay the, the test. And, you know, so because I work with Tesco, I, you know, I improved myself in speaking. Uh, and I would say the, the English language was going up and up. So, I tried the exam again and I got 6.5 instead of six. And I was totally happy. It was the, the day of the, uh, the enjoyment. I mean, the, 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 the dream day. Uh, well, I remember that day my father was crying actually uh, because it was a barrier to get into university. And it's been always the dream to get into university in, in Northern Ireland, I mean, Queens. Um, and, uh, you know, everything was coming true. I mean, the dream became, became a true. So uh, I started to improve myself also because I've got some time before to get into university. Uh, I started, uh, well, I did a course, inter interpretation course. So I, I became an interpreter, uh, um, a community interpreter. And the other course was advocacy course. So I was, uh, I became, uh, an advocate for the community as well. And because I've got those two uh, certificates, I was like, why not? You know, I, we had like a wee chat here in, in our ABC council uh, with three friends. Why not just, you know, uh, set up our organization, helping the refugees and asylum seekers. And they were like, yes, that's absolutely great because we are Syrians and we know the background of Syrian and we know their needs. We know everything about them. Why not just kick it off, you know, just start it up and nobody knows what's going to happen. We can ask other people who, who knows, I mean, who has like a good experience in this uh, stuff. And I nicely asked Lija to take, you know, to, to help us with that. And she was like, yes, I would do. Uh, well, actually, she's just helping us a lot. Uh, our organization name is an IHAD, and we do a lot of stuff at the moment with, with an IHAD. Well, all the, the stuff that I'm doing, volunteering, you know, just helping the community, improving myself, improving my confidence, you know, building the CV up. And um, I love it. I enjoy it. And I think that's me. If anybody wants to ask anything, more than welcome. Thank you so much, Hassan. That was great. And I think it's really important even to see how you have never stopped. You kept on going and there is still so much more. You And actually the comment are there. Your determination is incredible and an inspiration for people and how much you have worked really hard to make sure that you were integrating within uh, society, but also helping others alongside with you. And this is um, one of the points as well that we often talk about how organizations like this start out as volunteering, but do an amazing job. And that's why it's so important also to ensure that we are um, giving a platform to people like Hassan, that we're engaging with these uh, organizations to ensure that they are the one who know the community's needs best because they have the lived experience. People can have years of experience, transferable skills, but but when it comes to lived experience, there are things that Hassan would know better than someone who's had, I don't know, 20 years experience. Why would you uh, um, speak to an organization working with Syrians when you can speak to Hassan himself and tell you what it's been like for him? 
that is irreplaceable. If any, all the comments there, Hassan, I'm sure you're seeing them. Does anybody have any question for Hassan? I think it's all, thank you. Just, um, just a quick comment to Hassan, um, brilliant to see, because we work with the VPR program and just to see how your progress has come from day one to now, it's just a dream come true for every key worker out there that they want to see all their families progress so well. So well done. And just a note for Sophia or Safat. Safat, I'm Sudanese and I'm going to share my phone number with you so we could um, kind of share together at uh, times together. You can come to my house, I can come to yours and we'll meet up and we'll hopefully your three months will become three years before you know it. And welcome to Northern Ireland. Thank you very much, Anne. We now have, um, sorry, Lisa, go ahead. Sorry, Camilla, I was just going to say, um, if Hassan could uh, pop the name of his organisation into the chat, it would be great to know how we can support that organisation to grow as well. So, well, so, well, so, thank you so much. I do appreciate it. Thank you very much, Hassan. We now have Avril, and um, if we... We'll, if you have any questions, keep on putting them into the chat box and we can come back to any of the speakers. Um, we now have Avril. Avril is, uh, I'll let Avril tell us a bit about herself and what she has done, her involvement with the Syrian community since the first cohort came and what she has been doing since. Avril? Thank you so much. Um, it's really lovely to be here. Hassan, I understand your nerves. I'm absolutely terrified. Um, but you did really well. Um, so thank you for sharing your story. Um, I am an ESOL teacher, mostly in the charity and community sector, but I also teach private students as well. And over recent years, my students have become more and more from a refugee and asylum seeking background, although not solely. Um, I teach economic migrants, I teach international students. Um, and I love what I do. And after listening to Hassan's story, you'll probably understand why I love what I do. Um, because I get to meet very precious people like Hassan and Safa. Um, and I guess there's a number of things that have inspired me down the path that I've gone on. And the two of those has probably been experience and then my faith. I'm not, I'm not from a Muslim background. Um, I am a Christian. But my, my belief is that in my faith, it tells us that we should welcome the foreigner to our land and we should make them feel like they're part of us and that they should be integrated into our lives and our community. And the other has been my experience. Um, I've taught in several countries around the world, both Muslim majority and other countries. And my first experience was in Latin America. And I can remember going to a post office to post a present to my brother uh, for his birthday. And I was turned away from the counter four times in Spanish because I didn't understand what they were saying. And I can remember going out into the street and crying my heart out because I, I didn't understand. All I wanted to do was post a package and something that had been so simple three months prior in my home country was now really difficult and really complicated. And a very lovely Uruguayan lady came along and helped me um, overcome that hurdle. And I can remember thinking at that point, um, when I return to my country, I want to make that difference. Um, and I can remember being in a similar situation in the post office in my hometown um, in rural County Down, where I had a Polish person in front of me who was struggling to be understood. And that brought back to memory the fact that someone had helped me. And I guess I've committed um, in my own personal life and in my own personal faith to be that person who is willing to help on whatever level I can. And my English classes give me the opportunity to do so. Um, my classes are mostly done um, through other community organizations, as well as through some private. And most recently, they've kind of been all transferred onto Zoom, like everyone else's whole life. Um, but those students who I've had the privilege of teaching, actually since 2008, um, have become friends. And just the other day, I was in a local supermarket, and the very fresh lady I taught to read and write in English approached me. She recognized me apparently because of my walk, not because of my mask. Um, and she was a Somali student um, who had no English. And I haven't seen her in about eight years, but yet seeing her progress and seeing her story was just such a privilege. Um, I guess my opportunities to travel have given me a little bit of awareness of culture, but I guess the one thing I've learned is never to assume anything. Uh, to take each person as an individual, 
and to approach each student as a person who, for me, as a Christian, is made in the image of God and deserves to be treated with respect and dignity. I'm aware of the bigger picture of the complications. Um, I can remember teaching a group of students, um, some of them from the VPRS scheme, some of them from um, other nations. And the person who was coordinating this particular class just told me, you have Muslim students. But honestly, when a certain topic was raised, it felt like we had our own little mini um, Middle East political situation going on in that classroom. And that again reminded me that everyone's different because as I talked to the, those young boys, some of them, they were from, from different Islamic schools of thought. They were from different cultural identities and they didn't even all speak the same language. And so I've learned to ask more questions than make assumptions. Um, and quite often I get it wrong. Quite often I have been offensive unintentionally, but I've been very thankful for the forgiveness of my friends and of my students. But one of the things that I've come to realize is that English teaching, although learning a language is key for my students to survive in our culture, it's not the only thing that goes on in their lives. They come with so much more. They come with whole lives. And that includes problems with integration. That includes housing situations. That includes families stuck in war zones and home countries. And for me as an English teacher to have the assumption that they should be fully present in my class all of the time, I learned very quickly was an unrealistic expectation. And so I have aimed to have my classrooms become just a place where people can share their lives. And a lot of that has challenged me with regards to time because time is something, our culture is a very time oriented culture. This meeting will finish at 11.30 and I will aim to stop talking long before then. But you know, our friends come and my students come from a very different culture. Um, and so part of it is giving and taking. Part of it is teaching that my classes that start at 11 o'clock will start at 11 o'clock. But I'm willing to hang around um, and spend a little bit longer at the end um, to get to know my students and to help them in other areas of life. But I think the biggest key for me has been to see people as individuals. And to see that that changes how I, inter I interact with them. I don't interact with a class of 20. I interact with 20 individuals. Um, and each of those individuals comes with their own set of circumstances, comes with their own problems. And quite often, um, that comes with a, a greater privilege for me, probably, than for them. Because I get an insight into their lives. And I'm gutted that lockdown is still happening during Ramadan. Because usually some of my students invite me round. I'm so well fed. I put on lots of weight because I don't fast during the day, but I eat that extra meal in the evening. Um, and I miss that. But I, I long for the day when we can get back to that place. Um, and so I guess one of the things that Kumila asked me to share were some tips for other professionals who were seeking to engage with um, the refugee and asylum seeking Islamic community. And I think for me, the things that I've learned has been, have been to give people time, be willing to learn and ask questions, not make assumptions. Try to see things from their perspective. I will never understand Hassan or Sama's story fully, but I can try. And one of the ways that I tried to try and failed miserably was by learning Arabic. Um, and I tried it so many times, I tried it here. I even enrolled myself in a fully immersive program in the Middle East where I went along for six weeks and cried my heart out for every day of six weeks. But that changed my teaching style because all of a sudden I realized what it was like to be put on the spot and to be asked a question in a different language. And I realized the pressure that my students feel. I'm not saying you should all do that, but if you get the chance, it was worth it in the long run. To try and be culturally aware, um, but ultimately don't fear difference and to treat people with the dignity and respect that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Avru. And a lot of the cultural competence is something that we'll be touching on, but I think it's uh, very important to realize that people are gonna be at different stages of their journey. You have people who are like Safa will be here within three months and it's very difficult, it's very daunting, it's very challenging. And as Avru said, 
when you are put on the spot, it's knowing that the journey, how putting yourself in other people's shoes. I know that there was mentioned about people here within this room or people who are willing to learn, willing to engage. And these are not necessarily the people that we need to be getting to. It's the other people who are not willing to engage with us, people who are not willing to learn and be open to other cultures. And this is, as Naomi says, as much as we're going to shout really loudly and for people to know about us, for people to, and to engage with us, we need all of you to be able to make these happen. We need you to be having those conversations with your families, with your friends, with your colleague, and ensure that stories such as these, workshops such as these, keep on going throughout the community so that we do become the shared community that we want to see. Does any one of you have any questions there for uh, either of the speakers? Okay, I'm going to ask Avril a question then. Uh, Avril, uh, a lot of what we've seen is that um, grassroots organizations ha have been the one picking up a lot whenever people's support ended through the BPRS scheme. Do you find the title of these workshops has been Beyond Newcomer Narrative? When does one stop being a newcomer? Because uh, I feel that no matter how long people have been here, there's an assumption that because we, the, we are always going to be considered as the other, as the guest, as being treated like a guest. What are your views on those? And um, just something that comes to mind. Um, I can remember bumping into an old student um, as I was walking into city centre and he made a comment about how he was fed up with everyone calling him a refugee. He said, I've been here four years. Yes, I am a refugee. And he gave me his name and he said, but I'm this person and I, I now live in Belfast. Um, and I think newcomer, although it's helpful for us, I don't think it's necessarily helpful for the people that we label. Um, labels just generally aren't helpful. Um, and so actually, for me, I think, I think as long as we keep labeling people newcomers, they will always be newcomers. And in fact, I think from the get go, we need to actually see, start seeing people as people who will become part of our community and will become part of our lives. And will be, they have as much to contribute to society as I do. Um, you know, I go to a hairdresser who was one of my old students. My mechanic is now one of my old students. And so actually these people have as much to contribute to society as anyone else. And so as much as we use the term newcomer, I don't actually think labeling people or even labeling programs um, as newcomer programs is helpful because they then also feel this expectation to graduate from this newcomer, this newcomer narrative. And I don't think there's anything to say that that should be the case. Thank you. That is it. That is so true. Hassan, I have a question for you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, the, a lot, even though that you've had a really amazing journey and you've done really well, people are, I don't want people to go on to think that everybody, that the expectation on everyone would be the same. What advice would you give to people knowing that not everybody is going to uh, thrive like you have thrived? people are going to have different journeys and are going to have difficulty integrating into society. Well, yes, for, firstly, it depends about the personality, uh, it depends about, you know, your your character, if you know what I mean. Um, everybody will, we, we might, I mean, probably um, succeed in this country because everything is there for you out there. Just, you need just, you know, to, to, to put some effort uh, in to get them. Um, what I'm trying to say is, like, if I get success in, into, like, education, the others might get into work or, like, you know, training um, training course or, you know, something more practically, if you know what I mean. Um, so everyone has a chance to, 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 to reach to the point, you know, he, they, they want to. But 
the the idea or the the, the thing that I need to mention and uh, the people around them, the people surround them, who who are helping them, you know, because at first I I, I really need to say that. At the first stage, at the first step, I wanted to get into university. I went to Logan College. I'm so sorry if anybody from, you know, Logan College or, you know, here listen to me, but I need to say that. I've met somebody I'm not going to meet. I'm not going to say her name. Um, I just told her about my qualification. And, you know, she said, what's your qualification? She didn't say that, like, literally. She said it, like, you know, indirectly. Put your qualification in the bed because you could do nothing with them. You need to, you know, start over from the GCSE. So the point that I'm trying to point it out is um, we need good people to support those new newcomers. Good people with the, with the, you know, proper expect. Like, for example, for me, I had, uh, I needed somebody who knows a lot about, you know, education. And for, for people like who wants to get into work, they need people who have like knowledge about you know getting involved like for example requirement uh, what do you call it um, those agencies that you, you can sign up with them to get a job um one thing i i want to mention I, i'm so sorry i just you know want to use this chance guys i'm so sorry i talking talk talk to but Go ahead. I, 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 need, I need to mention yeah. this because I need the, the the community the community needs and I I saw I saw, I see them every day so that's why I want to mention them. Um, one of the uh, things that I found it um, just wasting time is um, when you are a job seeker that you are referred to something called step to success. You just waste your time there. Um, that's thing that that the thing that I wanted to mention actually. Um, I think that's that's all what I want to say. Thank you, Thank you very much, Hassan. I think we're coming up to the end. If no one has any question, I, I, what, we refer back to what Naomi and everyone has said. Hold your assumption lightly, as Hassan has said. You can be that bridge to how people are going to succeed, how people are going to go on to do better, to properly integrate into society. You can be that voice for people. And I hope that this workshop has been that an eye opener as to what is it that we can do to improve. Um, I'll pass it over on to Lisa. Thanks so much, Camilla. Um, thanks everyone for, for the session this morning. It's been fantastic as usual. Thank you very much, Naomi, for your very comprehensive talk. Um, really interesting. And thanks so much to all of you, uh, to yourself, Camilla, and all of the speakers um, that have joined us this morning. Take so much courage, and I still get nervous um, on Zoom as well. So just to say thank you very much for putting yourself out there and, and for helping us to understand more and learn more because as you say Camilla there's nothing that can replace that lived experience as well and Avril thanks so much for for guiding us um, I'm going to put I'm going to pop the the little tips that you've given into the chat and I'll see if the chat and send out to people with the recording so thanks so much to everybody and uh, we'll see you next week Camilla do you want to just give a wee brief outline of the next session um, during the next session, we'll be talking about cultural competence. So you've learned so far about the religion, the history. You've learned about the difference between culture and religion. But what do you do with that? Well, Avril has set the scene there a bit for next week as to how you actually work with people. Practical tips. And it's important to know that this is just coming to that workshop is not going to make you culturally competent within itself, but it's going to help you to start that journey or to wherever you are in that journey to keep on moving. We're going to be looking at cultural competency and how to improve, how to have those conversations. And we hope to see you there next week. Thank Thanks. you very much, everyone. Thanks a million. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you very much, <laughs> everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.